All right. Um, I think we're going to get started. Um, welcome everybody to this panel and thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to be talking on why we need to pay attention to the mental health of children and carers as journalists. And this is the first uh, panel in a series of webinars about early childhood reporting that uh, are part of the Early Childhood Journalism Initiative at the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma at Columbia University. And this initiative is possible thanks to the support of several foundations. Uh, they are the Bernard Van Leer Foundation in the Netherlands, the Maria Cecilia Soto Vigigal Foundation in Brazil, and the Two Leaders Fund in the US. Uh, so before we start with today's um, topic, I just uh, want to uh, make sure uh, that you know that we have four more webinars coming up on uh, migration coverage, on orphan children, on the climate crisis, and finally on how to report on diverse, diverse families um, sort of pushing beyond uh, stereotypes uh, in our work. Um, so just make sure to follow the DART Center on social media to find out more about the upcoming dates. Uh, we're recording this, um, but if you're joining us live, um, we'll have space at the end for questions. But if you feel um, like asking questions, um, just pop them in the chat and I'll be monitoring them. And also, if you want to introduce yourself um, and just say where you're from and where you work, that's also nice just to know what kind of diversity we have here. <clears throat> I see a few familiar faces, but also many that are not familiar. So um, it's always nice uh, to know more about the people attending. Um, just a couple of words about myself. I'm Irene Caselli, and I'll be your host and moderator tonight. I've been a journalist for almost 20 years. Um, I was a foreign correspondent in Latin America for a decade. And about five years ago, I started focusing on early childhood reporting, first as a staff writer at The Correspondent, and now with my own newsletter um, that is called The First Thousand Days. Um, I also collaborate with the DART Center's Early Childhood uh, Journalism Initiative, so you'll see me throughout this webinar series. And I'm, connected, uh, I'm connecting from outside of Athens in Greece, where I'm based. And now uh, to our guests um, in alphabetical order by name, <laughs> we'll start with Anya. Um, hello, Anya Kamenetz. Um, she's uh, been reporting on education for many years, uh, more recently for NPR, where she also co-created the podcast Life Kit Parenting uh, in partnership with Sesame Workshop. Anya is also the author of several books. Her latest is The Stolen Year, How, How COVID Changed uh, Children's Lives, which is coming up um, in August. Um, she was named a 2010 Game Changer in Education by the Huffington Post, received 2009, 2010, and 2015 National Awards for Education Reporting from the Education Writers Association in the US. And she's joining us from New York. Hello, Anya. Uh, then we're going on to Chandra Ghosh Ippen. She's a child trauma psychologist specializing in working with families with children under the age of six. She's co-developer of child parent psychotherapy and the associate director of the child trauma research program at the University of California, San Francisco. She spent over 30 years conducting clinical work, research, and training in the areas of childhood trauma and diversity-informed practice. She's also an award-winning children's book author, and she's joining us from San Francisco. Hello to you, Chandra. And then last but not least, uh, Tanmoy Goswami is the founding editor of Sanity, India's first independent reader-funded mental health journalism platform. Before starting out as an independent creator, Tanmoy was a staff writer at The Correspondent with me, associate editor at ET Prime, uh, the subscription based news venture of India's largest business newspaper, The Economics Times, and head of the desk at Fortune Magazine's uh, Indian edition. And Tanmoy has co authored a paper on suicide prevention for The Lancet Psychiatry and contributed a chapter to a book on leadership lessons from the coronavirus pandemic. He's joining us from New Delhi in India. So, hello, Tanmoy. Um, so, 
again, why mental health? Uh, we decided to dedicate uh, the first webinar in our series to this topic because we often get our conversations about mental health wrong and forget uh, that it is intrinsically connected to the child's environment, um, including to the experiences of uh, parents and caregivers. And it is influenced by a lot of external factors like war, poverty, disease, and access to opportunities, and also to funding. So we want to start um, by talking about mental health because it is in many ways what informs a lot of our reporting on other issues as well that involve young children like migration and climate. So just to get uh, us started, I would like to start uh, by asking Chandra, who's our expert here. Um, we would like you to tell us um, what, as an expert, you would like a journalist interviewing a young child to know and to have very present on their mind when they start off with their work. Okay. Thank you. So let's start with a basic understanding of child trauma. And I'm gonna share my screen so I can show you some pictures and share some metaphors that I often use. So I often describe trauma as a big, ugly cloud. And this cloud can affect how we see the world and how we see the road ahead of us. It can enter our bodies and weigh us down. And one of the hardest things for a parent is when something happens to their child. And that this is a cloud that hovers over the parent and the child and it can affect their relationship. Now, many of us have been taught culturally that when there are clouds, we have to keep moving forward. We run from the clouds. And that often works, except when things happen. So when we become a parent, key transitions in our life, when we get sick, lose a job, we often trip and fall and our history catches up with us. And I tell folks that this isn't the only way to deal with the clouds, that we've learned a lot and that we can't erase history or leave it by the side of the road, but we can stop it from haunting us. And we do this by turning and facing the clouds with someone that we love or someone we trust. And this idea that if we can make experience, if we can make meaning of, of our experiences and connect in our guts to the emotions that are associated with that experience, we transform it and we carry it differently. And if you look at the picture on the right, you know, you see that little people need big people to help them carry that experience. We say that caregivers are the co-creators of memory. And if you look at this picture, you can recognize that when people carry their history this way, they're often stronger than others, that they have muscles. Now, this next picture symbolizes the concept of the protective shield, this idea that little children believe kind of naturally that their grown-ups are all powerful, that no matter what, they can keep them safe from danger. And so in the words of Circle of Security, they believe that we are bigger, stronger, wiser, kind. And that this is a core aspect of attachment theory, because it's when you believe that your grown-up kind of basically has your back, that you can explore the world in good and healthy ways and learn. And unfortunately, when you have a young child who's experienced danger, even when it's not the parent's fault, they can feel as though their parent should have been able to keep them safe. And so this kind of sense of protection in this you know, situation with danger, it vanishes. And there's this feeling of being stranded. Where are you? Where were you when this happened? Which is often compounded because we as grownups don't really know how to talk about little, talk to little ones about their experiences. And so they're alone with these experiences of danger. Now, if we look at this picture, I want you to hold that this is a picture of danger, but it's a picture of danger with connection and protection. And this one here is a picture of danger without connection and protection. And as we look at it, if we shrink ourselves down and think about being that kid, we want to think, how do you survive? And that's where that might take us to common stress response pattern, to those things that we might actually call mental health challenges or behavioral health challenges, right? So fight. Somebody's got to fight this thing. Flight. Let's survive by running. Freeze. Maybe I need to hide. Don't move. Maybe I pass out and dissociate. Or maybe friend, maybe I learned that what I need to do is to keep everyone happy. I need to tiptoe around everybody, even at the expense of my own needs so that bad things don't happen. Or maybe I need to behave like the scary thing. I need to be just as big and bad. And we call that identification with the aggressor because maybe if I'm like them, it won't hurt me. 
Now, animals can also help us understand common ways that we can respond to danger. And these are characters from a story that I wrote. And here you can see that the dog at the top. So dog kind of shows us that sometimes we bark and growl and we carry that fight response. Rabbit is the runner. Turtle reminds us that some people slow down and hide in response to stress. A monkey clings and has separation anxiety. Skunk pushes people away with their stinky behavior. Squirrel talks endlessly in, about this and constantly is eating. And these are sort of symptoms of re-experiencing one of those hallmark PTSD clusters. Frog, you know, loses their voice. And that's sort of a sign of sort of the developmental regressions that we often see in little kids. Meerkat is hypervigilant and dissociative and elephant avoids and doesn't wanna talk about it. Now we help young children when we recognize you know, when we see these behaviors and we recognize that they're from a fear response. And we start by first acknowledging danger. And then really the kind of the, the orienting goal is that we need to rebuild the protective shield, right? We need to rebuild the idea that grownups can keep them safe. And if their grownups have challenges, we have to advocate for services that support their grownups because of course they have challenges, they've been through so much. And if that doesn't happen right away, we need to help children see that in general, as a community of grownups, we work together and that we keep them safe and we keep them connected to loved ones and well cared for. And if this isn't happening, and in some places it isn't, what we see is a rupture in our social contracts. And that's very important. And when that danger is very big, what we know is that it's not sufficient just to have parents. I mean, parents are very important. They're the closest thing to the kids, but families need communities to act as a protective shield and buffer them. And they need our society to act as a protective shield. Um, and this is where we sort of jointly acknowledge, hey, there's danger out there. And we take steps to repair harm. We have policies that repair harm. And we look at our fellow community members across the world as how can we support you in having safety, which is a universal need. Now, as journalists, you play a key role in helping society to see the harm. You honor people's stories and you help them feel heard and you move society to action when it's needed. And so this is critically important. And even as you're working with a family, the idea of helping them to metabolize their story and balancing the waves of emotion that might hit them as they're telling their story, those are all super important and things that I hope that we'll get into as we continue our discussion. Thank you very much for that, Chandra. I think it's a really interesting framework that we can come back to uh, throughout this webinar. And it's also a really tall challenge for us, very big challenge for us journalists, I think. Um, and so I have Anya and Tanmoy here. They've both worked um, with children within education on mental health uh, issues. Um, so Anya, I wanna come to you first when it comes to some of the things that that Chandra was uh, mentioning. How do we sort of keep these frameworks in our mind when sometimes the work is so fast, um, we need to go in, interview someone, uh, try to be respectful, try to honor their story, but also get a sense of how complex their their you know, mental health world is um, when they're children and for their family and society as well? That's a huge question. I think that um, there's a real ethical obligation on us as journalists to understand why we're doing what we're doing, why we're seeking the story that we're seeking, and that we make children and their caregivers our partners in that process of, of finding out how to tell a story. So, you know, um, and that, that requires really being uh, clear and honest with ourselves about our intentions and what type of story we're trying to tell. Uh, I think in the best case scenario, so um, I was recently in Ukraine and pretty much everybody that I talked with had been through a recent and severe trauma of losing their homes and sometimes of other things as well. Um, and so, you know, there are definitely several layers of this. So talking to, for example, the service providers that had been working with the families to get a, a big picture sense of where they're coming from and the types of things we're likely to learn in an interview. So doing that pre-interview where you really understand the surrounding situation. Um, and then there's sort of the difficult negotiation of, you know, who comes forward to tell their story 
um, you know, that has to be their choice. And we can't always, you know, talk to the people that you not everybody's prepared to speak in the same in the same way at the same time, um, just as um, you know, we saw in, in Chandra's presentation, people have different responses. And I certainly relate to a lot of times the people that are ready to sit down and talk to a reporter are having that kind of like intense recitation, like word, they're going in every single moment of what happened to them. And, and that's sort of, uh, it can be uncomfortable sometimes that you can kind of recognize that this is a situation that happens um, in, in, um, in, in, in trauma response. Um, I also really think that even in the, you know, if you want it to be helpful for people to tell their story to you, um, and we hope that it is not just helpful for the audience, but help, helpful for the person to tell the story, um, that they need to experience in themselves as agents in that telling. And um, there are different ways. I always try to take time in any interview, but especially with young people, to get to know who they are outside of this bad thing that happened. Um, what is it that they care about? What is it that they love? What is it that they look forward to? And um, the other part is, uh, you know, making sure that they have the open-ended moment to talk about um, what would you say to other people going through this situation? What do you want people to know about what, what happened here? Um, and also starting and ending the conversation on a positive point. Um, and I, I really had an unexpected, um, unexpectedly lovely moment in speaking to a teenager recently uh, about, you know, I basically what happened, how do you, how do you cope? What are your coping mechanisms? What are you doing to help you with what you went through, having to leave your home, losing your grandmother in the war, having your school destroyed? And he said, you know, I do all these things. I listen to music, I paint and draw, I call friends, and I also write poetry. And he read us one of his poems that he'd written, um, which was really beautiful and moving and also helped me see him as more than, than this traumatized boy. Thank you for that, Anya. And I'm seeing Tan Moy nodding <laughs> um, over here. Um, and Tan Moy, you obviously mental health is is what you report on. Um, where do children fit in uh, within your own reporting, and how do you, um, you know, how 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 can you sort of make justice and give agency to children when you're reporting on something as delicate as mental health? Um, thank you for having me. I'm a very big fan of all three of you and some of the people who are on the uh, on the call listening in. Um, I think I was reminded when uh, even as Anya was speaking, I was reminded of a conversation I had with um, a conflict medicine expert, um, a psychiatrist who has worked in uh, war zones, uh, Joseph El Khoury. And he said he was talking to me about the Syrian war. And um, he was uh, narrating a story involving a woman, a grown woman. Um, and he said, you know, everybody around that person was trying to talk, trying to get her to talk about the war and what she had experienced and, um, you know, what she had left behind. And she just wanted to talk about her mother-in-law. She did not want to talk about what it felt like to live in the tent and the constant bombardment and the violence and the loss of life. And, and I think that's the first principle that I have kind of, I try to internalize as a journalist when I started out in this field was that I think like doctors, we need to take that sort of first Hippocratic oath, which is first to do no harm. Um, sometimes in a bit to get the best possible story out of a particular situation, um, you know, we, we tend to get a bit carried away, reckless, we kind of uh, forget that we're talking to real human beings here. And of course, this is a, uh, a real struggle when it comes to children, because if you look at if you look at even the most sensitive uh, stories out there, which which are centered on young people's experiences, a typical story starts like this: um, Peter or Maria or whoever, you know, withdrew into their uh, into their room. They did not come out for six months. You know, the parents were very worried that they were getting drawn into this world of video games, or you know, it's always told from the point of view of an adult. Um, it, it's almost as if even when we talk about children's problems, uh, we can't legitimize it without centering it on the parents' experience, which is which defeats the whole point. And I think I am, um, as as a uh, as a journalist, as a user survivor, in the part of the world that I live in, 
um, it is a, a unique opportunity for me to always remind myself of what we are reporting about because, and I'm going to just sort of quote from a book that recently came out in India and trigger warning, I'm going to talk about suicide. So if anybody is uh, uncomfortable with the subject, please uh, tune out. Um, this is a book called Life Interrupted. This is by far India's probably you know, the first and most accessible book on suicide. And there is a chapter here called Not Too Young to Die. And I'm just going to give you some figures. Um, it, you know, the context is that in India, in the um, uh, you know under 40 age group, nothing kills uh, uh, you know more people than suicide. Suicide is the number one killer of young people in India. And here are some uh, here are some numbers from the pandemic years. So, suicides among children under 18 rose from about 9,600 to about 11,300. Um, in 2020, which was an 18.5% increase. Um, and uh, girls below 18 years are particularly vulnerable, dying in greater numbers than boys. This is a reversal of the trend that we see in the adult demographic. Um, while the gender ratio for overall suicides is 2.4, which is two and a half times more uh, men than women dying by suicide, the gender ratio for children under 18 years is 0.9, which means nine boys for 10 girls. So and and uh, 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 nine uh, yeah nine boys for ten girls and this you know the pandemic these numbers are very stark um, some of it was it's not altogether dif difficult to understand uh, you know why the stress levels uh, peaked in the younger demographic a lot a lot has been written already about it but here is another another aspect another another side of the story uh, that I was um, fortunate to fortunate to track in. And that is that exam-related suicides um, fell very noticeably in that age group. Now, what I take from that uh, insight as a, as a journalist and as somebody who tries to, you know, in my, through my advocacy, uh, influence policy, is that when we talk about children and mental health and suicide and all of these topics, we tend to constantly, like with adults, we tend to constantly medicalize this problem. We tend to constantly label it as a disorder, an epidemic. And, you know, the media plays a very big role in this sort of very, very uh, sensationalistic approach to mental health. Um, and as a result of that, what we miss highlighting is that these problems require intersectional, multifactorial solutions, multi-sectoral, uh, you know, engagements and interventions, not just let's create, you know, let's have more psychiatrists and let's have more therapists and let's send more kids into sort of medication or institutionalize them. We need um, educational reforms. We need for parents and caregivers to have support, um, employment support. Um, it is not at all surprising that in Brazil, where they ran the, the very famous uh, study on cash transfers, uh, young people and mothers were um, uh, shown to be the greatest beneficiaries. Uh, you know, there was a 61% fall in the likelihood of suicide in, in families that received uh, a mere $17 a month under the Balls of Familia project. So uh, I think, yeah, those are some of my um, uh, observations and insights. I think that mental health, whether it is in children or in adults, needs to be looked at as an intersectional a uh, multi-sectoral issue and not just a, a biomedical issue. Thank you very much for that, Tanmoy. I think we'll come back um, to sort of talk about the structural issues that we also need to report on when we're talking about mental health. But I want to pick up on something else you mentioned, which is the issue of agency. And actually, it's something that also Anya mentioned before, because, of course, um, talking about children, you know, when we talk about under 18, it's very confusing. There is such a range of ages and sort of ability to communicate. Um, and we are trying to sort of think a little bit more about early childhood. And so the zero to five sort of idea and how and, and that's where I want to go back to Chandra. How can we um, give agency as uh, interviewers, as reporters? Um, how can we respect the agency of children so young? Um, in uh, you know in interview settings but also you know tanmoy was uh making an example of i uh, was giving an example of how a, a typical story would start always from the perspective of a parent but how do we see the perspective of a child when probably we can't interview them especially when they're very young 
Um, that's a really good question. So you should know that I work with children who are zero to five, which means that I actually have two-year-olds telling me stories. And they tell us stories with toys. Um, they can show us people fighting. They can show us if you talk about how you used to live over here and your family had to move. They often will take the dolls and throw them everywhere. And what they're showing is that feeling of we got tossed around. Um, if their journey involved a boat or a plane, they'll do that. Um, but it'll be a mixture of fantasy and reality. And it'll also be a mixture of kind of gut speak. Um, and so if you're looking for the thread of truth, know that you're getting the purest truth. But it's not always fact. It's gut speak. It's fear. And that's something that you have to hold. And I'm not sure how you report on that, except for to really listen and to think about this is what our children are showing us, is that their insides are crumbling, that their world is destroyed, and that we have to really hold on to the impact on the parents. So when you're talking about the suicide rate rising, guess what? There are kids in that home. There are kids who are often the people who find the grown up who has had the attempt and who are sitting there, and that you don't go in necessarily to interview them, but you shine a spotlight on what are we doing to help the whole family? That, you know, there is too much of us are saying, oh, they're so little, they won't be affected. And you're actually, when you say things like that, you're giving the wrong theory and the wrong framework. And even as a reporter, as the first person on the scene, and sometimes as a reporter from another culture where people might say, oh, they're so wise, um, they might believe you. And so I want to just correct that misinformation first. And then we listen to see what are their behaviors showing us? How do we report on what the changes are in the child? That they're not eating, that they're not sleeping, that the parents are distressed, that this is their environment, that their world has changed. And then how do we not make that the whole story? Because these are thriving children. So, And these are little beings. And I really want you to think about how do you protect their names? Because even when somebody gives consent, right? We want to protect their names and their images because people can Google themselves. And when they grow up, sometimes we share the details of their trauma because we want the world to see this. But when you grow up and you're a teenager, those same details splashed in the news can make you feel really icky when you're a latency age kid. So I just also want us to think about how we act as protective shield as journalists in terms of thinking about that. And that, can I just, I'm going to say one other thing, but like when you're with a kid, I often tell people that I do what I call soundbite therapy when I work with parents. And we notice that children, they will sometimes start telling you something in their way with toys. Sometimes kids, you know, four or five with words straight out, they'll tell you. And then you'll notice that some kids, as they're talking to you, it's like their bodies are getting full of stress hormones. And they're so, sort of saying, you know what, I can't do this anymore. And I want you to listen to the wisdom of their body and to think about what they need to do. And what they might need to do is to cuddle with their caregiver, who hopefully is there with you. They, because they're their regulatory partner. They might need to draw, they might need to cook, play cooking. Um, they might need to get something to eat. But you'll notice sometimes that if you stick around, so you have to have longer periods of time, that if you stick around, they'll return to the subject. So they do these things in little sound bites, in these waves where they, they regulate and return and regulate and return. And that's sort of a pattern that we need in therapy. And it's a pattern that we need in journalism as well, because otherwise what you're doing is you're forcing the body to go at a pace that is not good for the body. And they have these little bodies. And so they know I can't deal with that much. Yes, um, that is, um... Yes, that, that, that is something that sometimes we don't have, right? The time to come back. And especially, you know, I'm thinking, Anya, back to your experience in Ukraine. You were obviously talking to slightly older children mainly, but, you know, how do you, um, you know, did you find yourself in any situation where you had to sort of move back? Or, I mean, I'm sure you have throughout your career, but um, it's always, you know, also Tanmoy, feel free to jump in. It's always hard with examples. I know there are loads of journalists on this call, mainly journalists. So feel free to uh, share examples as well, because I think it's very helpful. And Chandra can maybe also help us um, understand things that happened uh, to us throughout our reporting um, when we were suddenly faced by a child who ran away or a child that decided to start talking about something different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think with little ones, you really are in an observational mode and you're hoping to get them in a setting where they feel comfortable, where you can see them doing different kinds of actions, activities, and really kind of just observe their energy. Um, in my book reporting, I was following families over the course of a year. So I had that privilege to drop in over time and get to know the kids. But again, I mean, there were only a few of the kids in those families that were very young. And really for them, I was really relying on their, their parents to tell me about the changes that they saw and what they observed. Um, as well as, you know, I think another way in, if you're talking about a situation of trauma, particularly they, you know, the ones we're talking about, they don't just affect individuals, they affect communities. And so I've also learned a lot from talking to practitioners um, and to teachers and to other people who have daily contact and can say, this is how my class has, has experienced this year, or this is what we see um, in the in the refugee centers and three different refugee centers across Ukraine. I sat down and talked with the, the on-staff psychologists um, because they were getting, you know, the big picture of what people were coming in with and kind of could talk about the variations in responses. And that gave me, you know, not the individual stories, but it gave me the context that I could then bring to individual reporting. And so anything that you can do, whether you're going broad or you're going deep, um, and obviously over time is the best, is the best thing to do and, and, you know, give the amount of time that you can give, um, and, and the more watching that you can do, the better. I mean, also just with building rapport, I mean, helping, you know, where kids can, you know, playing or showing, showing you their favorite activities or favorite things that they like to do. And, you know, without directly going at kind of the tough, the tough questions right away. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I, I just want to speak really yes, quickly to, to the anonymity right. question, because it's just at NPR, we've had an evolution in how we think about this. And I would say that we've gone almost in the direction of default uh, first names only with 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 minors um, because there is such a huge context change and people do grow and and have the right to sort of be forgotten and that's something that you know in Europe especially they're very aware of when you're doing something online they can live online forever so that's kind of our default these days. Yeah, that's also very helpful, Anya. I think um, yes, I think with the anonymity question. Um, and and or just first names i mean i don't usually ever report on children with with a full uh sort of uh name but um because there's always this thought of you know especially when i report on for example migrant children um i don't usually tend to uh include their full names either um and uh and asylum seekers especially but sometimes it's interesting because families are really pushing for them to be recognized fully with pictures as well um and i always find it very troubling especially with children children's pictures you know to keep them anonymous etc and i think it's it's because they do believe that media have a strong um that they can help them you know recently i was um i was reporting in lesbos in greece on on asylum seekers from Afghanistan and the ones, especially the ones that were, you know, they had clear cases, they were quite keen to have their stories uh, published with their full names and pictures uh, because they thought it could actually help their files and they were keen to have their children in there as well. Um, I was sort of negotiating that and trying to keep the children out, but um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's really hard to navigate and to have sort of fixed rules for everything, like with everything else. Um, Tanmoy, was there something you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I must admit that I find it terrifying to, to interview young people and not just because I'm constantly, I constantly feel like I have to walk on eggshells or whether I trigger their trauma, which are all very, very serious concerns. But I am, I feel very, very um, vulnerable and frightened. I feel very vulnerable and frightened uh, because these, at least the young people that I've had the privilege of talking to, they are phenomenally intelligent, sensitive, uh, smart people. And when they look at me, they don't look at me first as a journalist. They look at me as an adult who is partly responsible for landing them in the shitty landscape that they find themselves in today. <laughs> so, so 
I have to acknowledge that sometimes we go into an interview thinking that the other person is looking at us as we look at ourselves, which is as reporters and journalists. But what the other person, especially if it's a, a young person, is looking at is a grown person. Uh, and there is a lot of anger. There is often a lot of anger that you, you're part of the problem. Uh, and so why should I tell you my story? What, what will come out of, the, uh, of this conversation? Um, so I feel like whenever I go into a, and uh, you know, just to, just to briefly um, uh, steer away from, from trauma as a topic, uh, if you remember, Irena, we had this uh, incredible experience at the correspondent where we had invited a bunch of young people to talk about climate justice. And I remember the energy and the conviction and the sort of really intimidating passion that they, that they brought to the table. And as an adult person witnessing that, I couldn't help but feel very uh, almost embarrassed that, you know, I mean, how can I, and, and in the act of reporting, there is uh, ingrained a power hierarchy. When you are the one who's asking the questions, you are the one with the power, right? And that never goes away, no matter how much, no matter what, um, uh, how mindful you are in your, in your interviewing. Um, so when I go to speak, when I try to speak to people, I often will speak to them two, three times before I actually speak to them about, you know, whatever my goal is. And uh, I have often realized that, um, uh, you know, with, with, with particular demographics, with young people, with old people, with young women, we go in with a lot of preconceived notions and we fit, want to fit these people and their stories into our hypotheses. And, you know, very often you will be surprised and you'll have to give yourself the, the latitude to deflect and tell a different story. If, you're, if, you're, if the task that you're talking to says, uh, hey, this is not who I am. You know, don't talk to me as if I am this, you know, poor little boy, a girl from a very uh, traumatic uh, context. Talk to me as a climate change expert. Talk to me as a gaming addiction expert. Talk to me as somebody who understands a lot about how to, uh, you know, even support my caregivers, my parents. And a lot of children grow up incredibly fast in, in uh, conflict situations, in, in difficult situations. So they want to be talked to as experts, not as subjects. And, uh, you know, I just go and I just, I basically just throw up my hands and say, you know, I probably know not even 10% of what you know already about climate justice and what it means to live with climate vulnerability. So please, can you help me understand what, what does it feel? And I, I generally don't go with scripts and questionnaires and things like that. So, but I still find myself horribly illiquid to talk to young people, to be frank. Yes, I totally agree, Tanwin. I think um, it's happened to me that I've gone into, um, I, I reported a lot on, on sort of the migration route also out of uh, Ecuador towards a sort of North America. And I remember going to this town where there had been, you know, loads of people had disappeared in the Mexican desert. And I went in with such a heavy heart and I was just so worried about, you know, kind of getting the right questions, etc. And I remember these children in this hut and, you know, they were sort of the classic, uh, you know, development migration reporting subjects, meaning, you know, they lived in very poor conditions, they just possibly lost several family members. Um, all they wanted to talk to me about was uh, football, and they wanted to show me like how they were playing. We're talking five, six, seven year olds, you know, of course, I wasn't going to interview them about what had happened to their family. But I think it's also very good to go back to the drawing that Chandra had. There's such a variety of reactions to things that are difficult and um, and a lot of them may be sort of focusing maybe on the positive, I want to say, and and or on what's around, you know, the play of foot, the, the game of football. And so I think also in that sense, it's very important to be listening and to be observing and to step out of, you know, the idea we had when we went in reporting. Chandra, I'm seeing you sort of thinking about what I just said, and I would love to hear um, your thoughts. And then I'll go to one of the questions from uh, the listeners. Yeah, my insides are churning because I so want you to talk about football and I so want the world to know the pain of these kids. And so many kids, like the fact that you can't talk about your brother because it hurts your heart so much, we cause that. 
Um, I work with kids who you can't say the word mother around them, or they go and they scream and hide under the table because it's so painful for them what's happened. And so their avoidance comes front and center. But if what we report on is, oh, the kids are playing football, then do we do damage? Because as a society, we're like, we'll see they're resilient. And what we know is that trauma leaves a trace. What we know is every birthday, they're sitting there with a hole in the heart and to the degree that they can't talk about it, it actually hurts them. And so look at certain things as avoidance. There are certain things you should be able to talk about. We have children who you bring out a medical kit and they run screaming from the room. That's not typical. That you cannot represent a father doll in the room because the doll itself holds such power. And so that's somebody speaking. And I just think it's important to yes, hold the strengths, but not gloss over it with this veneer of resilience. And because that's when we don't get the policies that pay for the services. Like we separated children at our border. Those kids are hurting. I wrote a book called um, When You Weren't With You Weren't With Me, Cuando No Estabas Conmigo. They've been reading that with immigrant families in Salinas. And the when, minute they open the door with that story, that is all the families have done for the last two weeks because the story opened the door because they saw themselves in that story. And then parents started talking about it with their kids. What was it like? You know, and these are kids who were three, four, five, you know, and older. What was it like when we weren't together? What are you holding inside? That dialogue needs to happen and our society needs to pay for that dialogue to happen when we've caused that harm. So I'm just saying my guts are churning because I work with the fours and fives. It's too easy to watch them draw and say, look, they're coloring. And it's like, yeah, Absolutely, they're coloring. They're coloring. Chandra. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I think there's a huge issue. I mean, I have a huge issue with the uh, word resilience because it just, you know, helps us gloss over so many things and and justify a lot of things. But it's such a I, I still think that going back to the, you know, football soccer example, it's very hard to get the balance right, especially if you go in for an afternoon, right? Because you want to also kind of do justice to the fact that they are avoiding with maybe a healthy mechanism, call it a healthy mechanism. But at the same time, yes, I mean, what else is happening? You know, what are they avoiding? What do they not want to bring up? Um, and uh, you, it's basically very hard to do that unless you know the people that are around them or you spend a bunch of time um, really observing the children or knew them from before. So I think, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, and uh, Tanmoy, did you want to say something? You're going yeah, to have spend... a go of res resilience, I know. <laughs> no, no, I'll just refer people to, to my article and drive some more traffic that way. But no, I, I just wanted to just take 10 seconds to also point out that, you know, journalists are not therapists. We are not mental health professionals and we don't need that extra burden on ourselves. We don't, it's okay to, you know, of course you should train yourself and you should educate yourself. But I think as long as we're dictated by that gut instinct of saying we will not do any more harm, to what has already happened, will not add any more harm to what has already happened to this to this person, to this character. Um, we should not we should not be sort of frozen, uh, thinking that we are going to you know, because then we are not doing the job that we are supposed to do, right? So, so I think uh, it's important to also sort of uh, give yourself, be vulnerable, and give yourself that that allow yourself that humanity that you know it's all right. You are not a trained expert. Um, and it's really a travesty that, I mean, we probably wouldn't even have to have this conversation if every newsroom in the world were to educate people on somebody mentioned trauma-informed reporting. Um, this should not be happening in sort of specialized sessions funded by two universities somewhere in the West. It should be happening in every single newsroom in the world. Um, and then we wouldn't have to have these little cloistered conversations. So, but I think, yeah, it's just, just something that helps me uh, remain grounded is that, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not a therapist and my trauma can also be triggered by a lot of these conversations. So it's important to, to allow yourself that space and that vulnerability, I think. Thank you so much for that, Tanmoy. And I think it's also important to do to to mention that that we also carry our own traumas, our um, and and that our own reactions. We also need to watch out for how we look after ourselves, um, especially in very challenging contexts or in contexts that can trigger us. Um, I just want to um, take advantage of the fact that we're talking about sort of trauma-informed reporting to. 
uh, read out a couple of questions. We have Indira who's asking what mistakes in the interview or in our coverage could fuel the drama. And then we also have uh, Marsha who's asking which words, oh, that moved, which words are appropriate to avoid making them appear as completely hopeless. So maybe I want to go to you, Chandra, to sort of take um, these two questions and, um, and brainstorm storm together. I can think of a bunch of words that I like to avoid. One of them is victim. It's very hard to avoid the word victim sometimes but you know I, tr I try to do that when i can i um i would wonder whether one of the mistakes would be because i'm not a journalist or you know haven't done anything like that for years but would be to privilege story over emotions over affect and um because you can feel it when it's happening you can feel it when someone's numbing out or you can feel it when they're flooding and so our humanity comes first and that's with some people, we do what Babette Rothschild said, we put on the brakes. And you do that by reminding them of your connection, that it sounds really hard, that right now I'm with you. Right now you're telling me about something um, and it's, you know, you're remembering. So we differentiate between remembering and reliving and we privilege that. So that's really important. And with a young child, a big mistake is to not involve their regulatory partner because you're not their regulatory partner. And so really thinking about co-regulation as opposed to coping. Um, and even in a shelter, who is that person's, who is that child's person? And how, when you're done talking about this, might that person help? The other thing is to actually go into a doom and gloom because the truth is they know that this happened. And what they're looking for is an available mind and available heart. And to the degree that rather than just kind of being down with our paperwork, we're actually feeling them. You, we have mirror neurons. And when someone feels us, we transform it. And so even you're not therapists, but we are all humans. And when someone feels you and hears you, that is part of your healing. It's a step towards it, even if it's just for five minutes. And so it's very important that you go into this also with hope that this too can be spoken that a four-year-old can talk about this and that when you see, when they tell you about their worst moment, you don't see them as destroyed, right? That that's, that's also very important that you hold the hope of looking at this full person, this full little being. Yes, um, that I see loads of uh, heads nodding um, here. Um, I wanna go to another question, which I think um, can help us sort of um, go a little bit further in this conversation. Um, it's from Mariam who's asking, from the ethical side, is it okay to interview the child who is unaware of what we are mostly asking about or the purpose of our project? And in terms of decision-making, they aren't in a position to give consent to our interview. How do you deal with this in the best way to ensure agency? And I would like, um, to ask Anya and Tanmoy as well about this, not only um, Chandra, but maybe Chandra, let's go back to the idea of agency that we kind of talked about. Um, what, you know, how do you ensure agency, explain what you're doing to a child who may not um, necessarily get the full context or the full dimension of what our reporting could mean? So I'm just going to play with this here. I have to, it always depends on the situation and the person, but you start by likely explaining who you are. I'm a person who tells people stories and I tell people stories because we want to make sure that when good things happen, that more of that happens. And when bad things happen, that we change things. And so what parts of your story would you like me to be able to tell other people about so that we can do more good things and stop more bad things? And then we might want to hold that, well, actually, they probably know a lot about this stuff. And so we often start with a wonder where we say, you know, there have been some very hard things that have happened in your community. We wonder what you've heard or what you've been through. Um, we know that you came from far away. We wonder what that was like. And a wonder doesn't have a demand of tell me. And so you kind of wonder off into the air and you give them a little time and sometimes they come back. And so they, they might share their story. 
but that's sort of a way of doing informed consent. And, you know, with immigration attorneys, we go in also and say, I am somebody who helps children tell their stories for this reason. And so we share that, we find that child language. Uh, Annie, I see you nodding. Um, do you want to jump in? Um, you know, the, it, it's something I dealt with here in the world that we live in now. Every parent has this ethical dilemma about telling their children's stories on social media. And so um, informed consent can be very difficult. And we have to acknowledge the fact that sometimes a child and their caregiver might have different interests, especially as the child gets older. Um, so it's very hard, um, but I, you know, I agree uh, with Chandra that you know making the informed consent as as clear as it can be, you know, and and for me as a radio reporter, you know, playing back something that's recorded or showing them how you know mechanically how does this work? This is being recorded. It can be lots of people can hear it. Um, so that's you know that's also a nice icebreaker as well with young kids. But um, and then talking hopefully you're talking to the caregiver and the, you know, if it's the organization as well as the family themselves about why are we telling the story? Why do we want people to know about this? And I did a story um, earlier in, in the pandemic about teen mental health. And I was asking teenagers to tell me about their darkest moments. And, you know, I think one of the things that was really helpful to help normalize it, first of all, talking to people with their caregiver present, even, even older teenagers, um, there was something really important about that for me, but also telling them, you know, this is really common. A lot of people feel this way. You can help by telling people about it because the more people know, the better. Um, that, so that sense of solidarity and that sense of sort of enlisting the, the kid, the family in that project, which is basically hopefully what you're doing, right? You're trying to tell the story so more people know so they can make a change. And I think it also helps as well in the, whatever you say to me, it's not gonna freak me out or I'm not gonna be alienated or pushed back on you because I know that this is common. And it's been a way for me to kind of introduce things to say like, some people I know have trouble sleeping when this happens, is this something that happened to you? Or some people I know had nightmares, is this something that happened to you? So by having that context, it kind of makes it easier to, for them to tell you what happened. Thank you for that. I, uh, I was just thinking about something when, uh, when you both were speaking about sort of um, how fine a line there is in language, you know, uh, sort of, for example, using the word wonder or saying, I know people that have gone through this, does that happen to you? Sometimes, um, you know, if you're working with translators or in contexts where you're not speaking the language, that's a very delicate uh, topic. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that, that I try to always point out when people are asking about tips is to really be, if you're working in a team and if you need a translator to really have a conversation about the importance of translating word by word and how I wonder is very different from I know, or I think, or, you know, and how each word has its own sort of weight in that sense. Um, and, and, you know, especially when you're working in a team with, you know, photographers or video people, etc. I always think that it's very important that we, we are all on board with the same sort of attitude. And it's not just the person that goes in to do the interview that understands what we're dealing with or how to kind of make no harm because um, it's very important to sort of all be on board. So, you know, I've I've talked to sort of translators asking for their help to kind of have delicate language. Sometimes it's very hard, especially when you're working with NGOs and they're lending you a translator. There's very little that you can demand. Um, but yeah, um, I just wanted to sort of um, talk about the importance of words in that sense. Chandra, you were uh, nodding. I'm sure this has come up <laughs> in migration contexts as well. I mean, you speak Spanish, but, um, and you probably worked with a lot of Spanish speakers, but um, yeah, that always helps. Um, I wanna go back to um, another, um, to, to a topic that we were sort of touching on before, which is 
structural issues, right? Mental health cannot be sort of seen uh, as independent from structural issues. Like I think about the US, like how can you talk about mental health of, you know, babies and caregivers without talking about maternity leave and, you know, loads of other policies and formula shortages and, you know, gun violence to name a few. But in India, there are so many others, including um, little funding when it comes to mental health. So. I um, I guess Tanmoy and Anya, I would like to sort of, um, you both reported on the structural issues around mental health and the mental health via structural issues. So maybe Tanmoy, let's go to you first. Um, you know, how, how connected they are. You were mentioning it before, but let's think about it again. Uh, yeah, sure, thank you. Um, I often get the feeling that we, we use the, term mental health when we don't want to talk about things like, things like uh, violence and climate change and, and you know, all these other, I mean, there is this psychiatrist who's a mentor of mine in India, Dr. Sonika Pathari, and he, he said something very striking, um, which is that a lot of the world's problems get created elsewhere and then they're dumped at the doorstep of the mental health sector. Um, and, and this is so true. And just to give you one example of, of a huge structural problem that just does not get talked about uh, especially in the Western media. Um, you alluded to the funding crunch, and this is one of my favorite examples. So I'm going to, I'm going to um, throw that at you. So, um, you know, there's this paper by a group of experts led by uh, Chunling Lu, who's a Harvard researcher. And, uh, you know, they call children and adolescent mental health the, the orphan of development health assistance. Now, here is a, uh, just, a pro just for context. So, uh, development health assistance is, you know, essentially foreign aid uh, that comes into the healthcare sector. Now, between 95, 1995 and 2015, over that 20 year period, and that's the latest data that I, that I have, uh, funding uh, towards mental health by donors uh, went up from about $18 million to $132 million. This is in the low and middle income countries, LMICs. The, the, you know, the jump seems quite pronounced from 18 million to 132 million. Of course, it's a laughably small number in absolute terms. But even more shocking is that this number was 0.4% of the total development assistance for health in general. 0.4% uh, was the money that went to mental health in LMICs from foreign donors. Now let's talk about children and adolescent mental health. Um, under 24s, they are 40% of the world's population. They are predominantly in low and middle income countries. They account for 25% of disability adjusted life years for uh, mental disorder and substance use. They account for 0.1% of the total development assistance for health and 12.5% of the development assistance for mental health. Nobody is talking about this. We are not going to be able to solve all these gigantic problems with uh, you know, 0.4% of health assistance. And the reality is that a lot of these countries do depend on, uh, you know, healthcare aid. Um, and again, not to start, not to start the suffering Olympics, every, uh, every kind of disorder requires, requires attention and funding. But again, I'll just finally leave you with another set of numbers. Um, uh, so development assistance for, for health for disability adjusted life care, DALI, which is a very common metric, HIV AIDS, $144, maternal neonatal health TB malaria, $32 to $48. Uh, so you can already see the you can already see the sharp drop from $144 to $32 to $48. And mental and substance use disorders and other NCDs, non-communicable diseases, less than $1. Uh, I just stopped there. Yeah, it's very hard to follow from those numbers, but I think Anya has the chance to sort of talk to structural issues in the US, which are just as baffling, I guess, in many ways, in different ways. I mean, I guess what I would say about that is just, um, you can you can always inform your reporting of structural issues by talking about the impact on the psyches and the emotional experiences and the developmental experiences of young people, and you should. So something as abstract as housing policy or potentially or education funding um, can be brought home by talking about the impact and how people are actually experiencing it and how they're experiencing it includes their emotional health and their mental health. 
So to me, it enriches the structural reporting to include the mental health aspect. And how I became aware of mental health as a topic, you know, coming as an education reporter, it was from listening to teachers tell me that they can't teach their classes because of the emotional pain and struggles that their students are going through. And they must have social and emotional learning development and support in their schools in order to maintain um, what they're doing. So that's really the, um, I mean, that's where, it, that's how it got me here. I can't be an education reporter without being a mental health reporter because there is no much education without mental health. So I, I see mental health as being inextricable from any structural issue that you want to report on, as long as it affects people. Yeah, uh, Chandra, I'm seeing you uh, nodding heavily. Please jump in. I mean, I think we're seeing people start to make that connection. And as they do, they're moving towards trauma. And as you move to trauma, I wanted to sort of broaden the lens, which I see a lot of you doing, but you've probably heard about the adverse childhood experiences, the ACEs, right? And so there's a lot of people who start to do heavily ACE-focused reporting. And I, I just wanted to share my screen because I wanted us to think about, this is Bronfenbrenner's model. When we think about structural, children live in families, families live in communities, communities live in society. And when we start to awaken to trauma, we often focus on the layer of the family, on what is happening there, abuse, violence, and other things. And we call those the ACEs, but it's very important that you maintain a focus on the adverse community experiences, on poverty, on racism, on the things that we're talking about, structural inequalities, what Tan Moy brought up. And then also that we think about what I call the original ACEs, the atrocious cultural experiences, the what came before that you also talked about, which is often colonization, which is often slavery, which is often boarding schools. And so that we have this full picture. And I know that that's a big ask, but I just wanna say that when you only focus on this, oops, sorry, on this layer of the family, you can do damage because the reporting becomes on problems within families without acknowledging the larger context. And so, and if you, the metaphor would be this, if you squeeze anyone hard enough from the outside with structural inequities, we will pop on the inside. We will fight with those closest to us. And so it's very much kind of a there, but for the grace of God go I. And so, you know, I've privileged to be protected by layers um, of what, you know, I've been born into. But I think there, there is this need for recognition of the broader picture. And so I just wanted to bring this visual to your mind so that you could think about when I'm reporting on this, how am I raising people's consequent co consciousness about the sociocultural context, the broader ecological historical context that created this? So we're not looking at families from Nicaragua, from El Salvador, from Guatemala, from Mexico as problematic because in truth, a lot of our policies created those things as they're coming here. A lot of our ongoing substance use and whatnot created that. And so we have to have this broader picture of, yes, there is fighting in the family. And the war, the original war started elsewhere, that sometimes the war comes into the family. So I just hope that you carry that into your reporting because people will run with this, these problematic people. And then we actually don't get the funding for mental health. Whereas if we think about this, as my friend Marquita May says, she says, these are our back wages, give them to us. Um, we earned this long time ago and we deserve to have good maternal health because the reason we have high rates of infant mortality with black women is because of what happened um, to them, that it made the birthing process traumatic. And we have to get real about that kind of unreckoned historical trauma and the, the, the need for repair. And that's sort of, the, there's been a rupture in protection. And so how do we repair that? And I do think that journalism plays a role in this, that it's not only yours, it's ours together, but that you play a role in, in, in providing that context when you report. And many of you do that, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you for that too, Chandra. I just um, want to say that we're going to wrap up in just a little under 10 minutes, so eight minutes or so. So if you have questions, this is your moment. Um, but um, also, I, um, I want to go back to the issue of early childhood specifically, because of course, it's my own personal uh, passion and obsession. And there is something that um, that we mentioned towards the beginning uh, around 
still or that Chandra mentioned, I guess, around the misunderstanding still that children are too young for understanding or for really getting their context. You actually told me a pretty um, like like an anecdote that has been uh, coming going through my mind since you did um around a bad accident and a two-year-old um and um sort of uh specialists around saying that a two-year-old was not uh capable of remembering so i want to handle just for a few minutes this idea of memory and what it means for a child um under five but also you know under two to keep a memory of things that are bad and how can we respect that then in our reporting? So let me answer this in a couple of different ways, if that's okay, Irene. So one, I ask people, how many people here have rescue animals? And how many people here have backstories for your, their rescue animals? Such that if someone came to my house and I said, I have a puppy and I think he was hurt by a man and the man was wore a lot of hats, could you take off your hat? That you would do that. Because then you, what you realize is that around the world, we believe that animals remember, but we don't give babies the same credit. And we have to kind of lean into that and think about that. And then in the work that I do, I hear stories with toys from kids. And so I was working with a little girl who had been seriously injured in a, a violent act. And um, she was in the hospital, she had a head injury and people thought maybe she was brain damaged later on. And she did this amazing play where she would lie down and go, I died. And this was when she was four years old. And that then she found this little ambulance and she kept playing the siren over and over and over again. And as she played it over and over, I, I asked, I said, you know, like, it's really loud. I asked her mom, should we take the batteries out? And the minute I said it, I said, oh, you did not get to take the batteries out. You were in the ambulance and the siren never stopped. And she looked at me and she was like, uh huh. And we were like, oh, she hasn't been able to learn in school because she's in a school where there are all these sirens that go by. And every time the sirens go by, she, her body goes into an alarm state and she can't learn. And we looked at her and we said, hey, did anyone ever tell you why we turn the sirens on? And she's lying on the ground and she goes, hey. and so her mom, her foster mom and I, we said, we said, it's to say, go faster, go faster, because they wanted to get you some help. Now, that's an example of a young kid who is holding on in their body, the body keeps the score. Those are the words of Bessel van der Kolk, right? That she's holding on to that memory and she's trying to share it with somebody like, why would you have put me in this agent of doom, right? And that when she got the answer and her mom actually took her to visit paramedics and they let her turn on and off the siren and they talked to her about what she did and she stopped startling to sirens. Um, but she had lots of things like that, right? And what we think about is people say, do kids remember? And what I would say is, what did they learn? And what, because they were so little, do they not have an understanding of? Like Bob Pinu said, that if you want to understand how trauma affects young children, shrink yourself down to their age and walk it through. And then you realize that even like the NICU experience, not even, but especially what you learn to expect, your trauma-related expectations are that when people come towards your body, they might poke you, they might hurt you. And so you learn to flinch and pull away from people. Now, that's just a real clear example of body-based memory, right? And that's where we have to undo this idea that they're too little to remember. What they are is they remember, but they're also so little that they're capable of new learning. But it's critical that the grown-ups hold that hope and say, if I acknowledge that the ABCs of trauma, if I A, acknowledge that the B, the body remembers, and you make the connection, right, because you're curious, you can help them have new learning that when I come to your body, I woo you back to safety, right, that we can learn new things about ambulances, that these are actually people who are there to help you, that sometimes in your life, people have gotten mad and scary, but most grownups don't. Most grownups are bigger, wiser, stronger kind. And so I think it's very important that we lean into the fact that they remember, because when we acknowledge that, then we support, kind of we say, oh, those behaviors, that's because you're scared. And my body knows what to do when you're scared. I need to earn the right to, to, to be seen as somebody who's safe. And I need you to woo you back to safety. 
Thank you, Chandra. And I think as a journalist, I mean, you know, we're saying we're not psychologists. I think it's like very important to remember all of this because in the end, uh, you know, when you go in a situation when there are mothers with infants, etc. For example, I find it very hard to interview a mother about about what happened when there is an infant around. And sometimes I've been told, like, don't be so weird about it. You know, it's just, you know, this child is not going to listen. But I always think about the mother's uh, body reaction, right? Like if they get stressed, like are they gonna smell different? Is the child gonna be unsettled? And so I think it's it's really important that we understand also like th these effects of trauma on babies, on on carers, just in terms of, of trying to do a better job. Um, so thank you for that. And I just want to, we have two minutes, but very briefly, this is a very difficult question from Juana. Um, it's, um, is it still valuable if we write about the impact on young children who lost their parents because of domestic violence, interviewing only their present caregivers? And I want to put this to Chandra, but I'm happy if Tanmoy and Anya have experience of this. Um, and. We have a couple of minutes and if anyone needs to leave, you know, we can also run a couple of minutes, you know, longer if needed. Um, I think sometimes that's all you have, to be honest. And so I just, you know, I think Alicia says, do not let the perfect be the enemy of the possible. Um, but then you think about what aspects of the child's story aren't told and how can you acknowledge that? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, uh, just I would go forensically at it. I would say, is there any art from the kids? Is there any possessions of the kids? Any photos of the kids? Any mem any videos that you have? Any other externalized memory that can help us get a sense of this child's experience? It's also to remember that even when a parent has been violent, sometimes they've been mixed. And so, you know, I think what children struggle with is how can the parent that I love also be the parent who has treated my other parent or me so violently? And so that inner turmoil, I don't know if that gets represented or, you know, if it should, but I'm just putting it out there that I think sometimes we paint a very kind of one-sided view of the person. Um, Anya needs to go, but also we're hitting, we're hitting, you know, the mark um, of our hour and 15 minutes. Um, I'm glad we managed to get to Juana's um, question as well. Um, and I just wanted to thank you everyone uh, for your very uh, deep and interesting questions and especially the panelists, Chandra, Tanmoy and Dania who's now left for such an important webinar. Uh, I mean, I feel that I have so many notes and I'll, I need to write about this and listen back in order to sort of make sense of all the important stuff. Um, so thank you very much again and just stay tuned around the other webinars. And uh, there's gonna be, this is gonna be posted on, on the Dart Center website. So you'll be able to watch back and listen back. Thank you very much, everyone.